Bracket racing isn't just what we do, it's who we are. It's how we identify ourselves. What does bracket racing mean to me? It's my life. It's where my people are. My idols, my family, my friends. Bracket racing is life. Bracket life. Hello and welcome back to the Bracket Life broadcast uh, for episode four. It's great to be back here, uh, Brandon, obviously, and then with my wonderful co-host, Andrew, as always. So great to have you here, Andrew, again. I'm excited to be back. I look forward to this every two weeks. It feels like some weeks it's like seven days goes by and I'm ready to do this again. And other times it feels like it's been a month since we last did it, but always excited to do it. Absolutely. And there's so much that goes on, right? There's so much uh, to talk about. It's, it's a lot of fun. Really enjoy doing all of it. Um, so we'll get started. Uh, got some big news coming for Canadian racers uh, and, you know, parts suppliers. So, yeah, this would be a big one. Uh, so this would be a great one for you to lead off with here. Uh, big news for the Ogilvy family, the Barker family, Ogilvy's Auto. So uh, why don't you kick it off? Tell us about what's going on, what you got coming, and what's going on here. Absolutely. So uh, we got officially... Uh, Ogilvy's Auto and Fleet Service will be a dealer for FTI performance. Uh, so, you know, all transmissions, converters, parts like that, uh, we'll he- keep in stock here in Canada. Big thing for that will be, you know, the huge advantage for Canadian racers to have access to all of these products in Canada. You don't have to deal with the exchange rate, right? It's all Canadian dollars, um, no duty. You don't have to worry about getting it across the border. Um, and when stuff's in stock, right, it's a lot easier to ship from uh, from Jasper, Ontario, anywhere in Canada than it is uh, from Bradenton, Florida. <laughs> absolutely. absolutely. Yeah. So I'll be excited. For, uh, yeah, absolutely. So am I. It's really cool because you and I both know the struggle of getting parts across the border, as yeah. most people do, right? You wait for it, and then you never know what's going to happen. How long does it sit at the border for if they let it through, if they don't? Um, brokerage, if you're not dealing through somewhere that has a brokerage set up, right? Like it's. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so for more information, all that, obviously, you know, check them out. Ogilvy's Auto and Fleet Service on Facebook. Uh, updates there. Uh, Instagram o- at Ogilvy's Auto or Ogilvy's uh, You can check it out now. Uh, the FTI stuff isn't listed yet because we're still getting it. Um, but all the other stuff for bracket racing, everything that we offer, the K&R products, and, yeah, all that stuff. So check it out. See whatever you can find, you know, see some new stuff and keep checking back. And then they'll be updated as everything else comes out, pricing gets set up. Or if you have any questions, just shoot me a message. You know, you can shoot Brack Life message, shoot me one, whatever. So we'll do through that. Excellent. Excellent. Absolutely. So big weekend of uh, racing. Um, I know it wasn't part of the Super Pro conversation, but uh, there was a lot of racing going on this weekend between Arizona and HRA. Uh, Lights Out 13, a lot of Canadian content kind of all over the place. It was... Uh, thought uh, worth mentioning we would uh, we were talking earlier today and you were telling me that there was what 20 canadians at uh, the arizona nhra nationals running down Absolutely. this weekend yes sir so yeah. i was going to look it up actually i'll do it quick here now um i'm curious about what the drive to phoenix is yeah. you know from yeah. anywhere in alberta so i can figure that out if anybody does know you know yeah i'd be curious he's like i've heard vegas like guys talking like it's 30 something hours to Vegas. And uh, I don't pretend to be a, a real scholar on the U S uh, geography, but Arizona doesn't strike me as right Close. beside Nevada. So yeah. uh, it's gotta be heck of a drive. I was watching, uh, I had it on the background while I was doing work out in the shop and doing things. And I wasn't sure if it was uh, like a bunch of Canadians down there or just watching one Canadian going around. Cause I kept hearing about like, you know, like John Smith, right? And they'd be leading yeah. into the background noise. And then I'd hear blank, blank Canada. But uh, I think it was Ken Mosta, which was going around some super gas. Um, yes, he actually he was down to four cars, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And then lost a close race. Won some, against some good cars too, like like Ed Olpin, who's a big West Coast super gas hitter, top sportsman driver, took him out. Um, I saw another one there. It was a great burn down with uh, uh, Mike Wibblehausen, I think. I probably butchered that name terribly, but I caught that round. And I mean, 
like nobody wanted to go in, I think, even to pre-stage. Um, and it was a great race on that one. And then uh, it was um, Mike uh, Bonner, I think he lost to in the end on just a ridiculous double breakout event where they were going 155 to 151 and neither one of those cars, like there's 20 mile an hour on the table at least when those Absolutely. guys had to strike on a double breakout. But uh, it was yeah. fun to watch nonetheless. It's and cool. lights out 13. There was a bunch of guys down there too. Well, not really bracket side, but I mean, you know, fun to watch guys, right? Nick Agostino, Enzo Pacini. Uh, I think I got that one right too. Someone will yeah, correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah. Um, yeah. And uh, Paolo Juiced, right? Yeah, Paolo, yeah. Oh. Yeah, Paolo's down there with Black Betty. Yeah, yeah. That was, uh, he went down to eight, I think. Uh, I believe so, yes. You that, know, was the, that, was, that was at the Sunday morning, 9.30 a.m. round, I think. It could have been. I'm not sure when it was. I know all I saw was the qualifying rounds. Okay. Um, you know, three sixty five, that's getting it done. Yeah, they were hauling down there. They did a good job. Like it was I, I don't like I don't religiously follow a lot of heads up racing and, and yeah. maybe more particularly radio racing just because it's it's out of a wheelhouse that I kind of exist in. Yeah. But that event always seems to at least drawn because of the Canadian content, right? Like Absolutely. You see guys pack it up and going down, you watch it in the news feed. So you're just naturally drawn in because you've got guys you you know or indirectly know going, right? So um, I'm jumping in on that. Um, Kenny Heber was down there. I just saw Chuck mention that. We talked about Kenny. He's on his you know world tour. He was in Gulfport last week running uh, um, the King of the Coast series. I was messaging with him. I think he's heading back there for a big money race. He's So he uh, was in Gulfport, heading to Lights Out in Georgia, camping out and then heading back to Gulfport with uh, the mini and the, uh, the dragsters. So there's a lot of Canadians out there rolling around right now, which is uh, really fun to see. Right. So especially when we've got nothing to do for a little while left up here. And nice to see it, uh, it happen again. Right. Nice that yeah. we can all start doing it. I know there've been a few people that have been down there, um, but it, it, it always seems so unrealistic, I guess, to get yeah. across the board the last two years. So it is really nice that it can start happening again. Absolutely. Right? And then gives us hope for uh, for ourselves to be able to cross the border as well. Right. And I'll keep rechecking what it's going to take to get over and back. And uh, I'm getting more yeah. and more excited. I'm not quite there yet. There's still a few things that are going to make it hard for what we do. And yeah. just, but at least it's on the agenda as a possibility. And that's fun. There's a lot of U.S. tracks, a lot of U.S. friends that I miss uh, getting down to see and, and, and race with. Right. So, as I'm sure there's with others. So it's, uh, Absolutely. it's fun no, to see. That. Fun. We'll get there. Hopefully, we'll get there. Right. Yep. We got to hold out. Um, so we'll jump into it uh, tonight as advertised. We are talking about, you know, top bulb tech or super pro tech. So we're not going to look at stuff like tech is in your seatbelts are expired or whatever. Your sticker on your transmission is out of date. You know, we're not talking about that. We're talking about tech is in technology. Um, you know, your ignition systems, grid, digital, you know, digital seven. That's what I use. Um, all the EFI stuff, kind of how much technology is really in these cars, how advanced they are, um, because it seems, for the most part, or to most people, I think, we still run carburetors, right? This is technology from how long ago that isn't used anymore. So Yeah, like mainstream automotive world has left this stuff in its its path, yet it's, it's the dominant uh, device in, in um, you know, bracket racing. Right. Like yes. there's stuff out there running EFI, but I mean, if you go to any big money race, any foot brake race, you know, um, even super stock and, and stock where it's, there are advantages to that form of racing to use EFI due to horsepower ratings and modern engines, yeah. you're still predominantly going to open a hood and see a carburetor. Right. So it's, yeah. it's kind of funny that this technology is still there, but it's still so good, but there's a lot of other parts to this that's really, you know, kicked up and even aspects to the EFI that I don't know have been, quite opened up or refined enough yet to become, um, you know, as, as good as the car, but definitely has chances to do that. Right. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, something we wanted to bring up and what I want your opinion on a little bit is how much of this, you know, I know you're a little bit, not as much that you've used it. Cause I know that the technology in your race cars is, you know, probably as old as I am. It, it's, it's, um, the yeah. flat out is antiquated. I, 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 you know, we have just put like a, um, a crank trigger and we bought a seven AL analog to put into the Corvette. And that is now the lead vehicle with the most technology. 
in it. Right. I mean, we've got a race pack and I've had a race pack for years in it and it was, it was worthwhile, but like six AL analog six AL. So stuff you can't buy controllers for anymore is what was yeah. in everything across the board. Yeah. And so it's never been an area of technology I've, I've looked into because I've, I felt confident with what I had, you know, um, but we elected to, you know, step into the 21st century, I guess, right. Grab a crank trigger, which does not seem like 21st century technology. It still seems yeah. like that's not new stuff, but um, we felt we need, wanted to move there. So it was one of those areas where like, I've been through tech, I've been to the million dollar races. I've watched them. I've watched them open the door of my car, look at my six AL analog laugh and say, okay, you're good and move on. Right. Um, but I've never looked into what is all involved. You know, I've talked about using a grid, right. But it's kind of neat when you start to understand this stuff, you know, what it can do. And then it gets a little scary a little bit with what it can do. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, so, I mean, I sat down and started looking at things. I mean, a lot of this stuff, there'd be folks out there who have grids, who have digital issue boxes like Jesus, like this guy sounds like he's from 1970, but in all honesty, it's stuff I never knew. And, And it's neat because you learn what you can and can't do with it. And then you also learn when you start to read some of the stuff that even like MSD puts out, how, involved this is but how easy it is to tech then you transfer that to your real life and realize i don't think anyone's ever looked at this like other than going to some really big money events i've been through a lot of techs and i've been through a lot of tracks and i've i've been through ihra and through nhra and i mean whether they they looked at something and i didn't pick up on them looking at it i don't feel they looked at it yeah you know and uh so it opens up that discussion of you know how much tech should or shouldn't there be at the local track, right? And people say, well, listen, the guys who are running for 600 to 2,500 locally, like who's going to cheat? Who's going to use this stuff, right? To run for that mm-hmm. little bit of money. And you realize people cheat at bingo. Yeah. You know, uh, Thursday night bingo, church bingo. Like there are people who will try to cheat for $100. It doesn't matter what the amount is. It's, it's a matter of whether they feel they can get away with doing something. And it doesn't matter what level it's at, Right. The bigger the prize, the more likeliness. So I felt like it was a discussion worth having, um, particularly on a local level, because I don't think it happens. And it's not, I think, all that difficult. Like, there's an education course. And, and I'll be frank, I've taken that, you know, course where I've started to look stuff up that I had no idea what it was. I don't have a laptop to hook up to my car to change ignition timing. I have a timing light and a wrench. But yeah. when you do start to look at it, um, I think there's an avenue there that we can do better at. I don't want to say Canadian, but more local tracks, right? Be generic on this, that it isn't that rocket science-y, you know, and there's a lot of go, no go aspects to it that make it easy to, to do. It's just a matter of initiative to do it. Right. Um, you know, we've, I've, I've, I've been in the pits and heard about guys talking about, you know, honestly saying like, I think that car has an arc module in it. Right. And, and okay, well, what is an arc module? Well, it's, yeah. it's a, it's an RPM, overtime uh, device that that will pull timing out to create an RPM curve that mimics an original curve that should make this easier to be able to, uh, to run a consistent number. Mm-hmm. So you overlay a line and you tell the computer, I want you to follow this line of RPM over time, whether that's out of uh, the drive shaft or an engine or a combination of the two. And I don't want it to go any further than this second line. And if it does pull this much timing out of it, or do something like any sort of 12 volt event, right? And if it goes past the second line, I want you to do this, which again might be pull more timing or do another event. And if it goes past this third line, um, do something else, right? So in, in most applications I've seen, it's pull timing, pull timing, and then go on to like a two step, right? It doesn't mean it couldn't be hooked up to something else. Could be hooked up to nitrous, um, could be hooked with nitrous end time. Like I mean, we mess around with timing and nitrous, but like, you know, otherwise that's when hood scoops, that's I guess, go, uh, yeah, that's where it works. But, um, you know, there's, there's different ways. I mean, in theory, a nitrous and throttle stop systems could be hooked up to do things like this, right? No different than just having timing, but it's a matter of, it's not hard to police these things. If you know what you're looking for, like you can hide an arc module with shy changing stickers on the front of it, I guess. Yes. But the grid will tell you if one's been hooked up to it. And it wasn't hard to find this info. So that's where I get into the conversations of why can't we do this at the track? Why isn't this happening? I mean, you know, there's always questions. Again, when someone gets hot and gets going good, 
there's always inevitably a group that doesn't know these people that right. starts questioning things, right? And it's the nature of sport. It's been like that since I got into the big cars, right? The second someone couldn't beat someone, well, they got to be doing something, right? It yeah. just seems like it's natural, right? Exactly. And then it's interesting, right? And then I think that's kind of the purpose of why we want to talk about it is <clears throat> to a certain degree, racers will all police the racers, right? I don't know how much of a, and I've heard other opinions and stuff on this. Um, I don't know how much of like, you know, NHRA does what they can to have a sanctioning body, but that's not the only NHRA can't have their hand on everything, right? So somebody has to be paying attention, but there also has to be a point where you educate the racers to identify, Hey, that is what this might look like. Right now you should be suspicious of it. Right. And then how to just verify that, right. Whether you just Google it as you did, right. And you sent me all the stuff when we had first looked at it, but you know, this, whatever light sequence of whatever, that means that the arc module is being used. Okay. What is an arc module? Oh, that's bad. You're not allowed to use those for this reason. So that's what I know we want to bring the light to, or at least start the conversation with that. So everybody knows what's happening. Yeah. Like it's, it's, it's one of those things I feel it becomes a taboo issue, right? Like no one wants to talk about stuff out in the open, but then everyone all of a sudden starts talking in the open when it seems like it's, you know, um, not being looked after. Right. And I mean, this isn't a conversation saying there's rampant cheating and racing. I, I've sat down and I've, I have thought about that hard. And like, I don't think that's a thing. I, I think there are people doing it. I, people who have done it, I mean, clearly through the history of bracket racing specifically, but I mean, you can pull up, every form of drag racing and find, you know, something that was a conspiracy theorist type of feel to it that later became public, uh, I won't say knowledge, but like, you know, mid nineties pro stock and nitrous, you know, yes, no one's ever really said it, it happened, but I think it's a general consensus that there were a lot of cars running NOS stickers underneath paint jobs uh, yes. through that era. You know, we've had it in bracket racing with the Matty box, you know, a very fundamental system that really was, I don't think uh, relaying specific info back to cars to make the car change, but, you know, essentially it's picking up wheel speed over time, relaying that info back to attack and letting the driver make a determination of where it needs to be. Essentially, if you're over this number, you're going too fast. If you're under this number, you're going too slow. You make the decision on how to get to that point. Yeah. It's not rocket science stuff. And it was happening back when technology still wasn't all that sophisticated. Um, I say that's in like the nineties and early two thousands, which is weird to say that that's not sophisticated. It doesn't seem like that long ago, but uh, regardless, so it's not a rampant issue, but I think it's one that because it doesn't get dealt with as much as it should amongst the non elite level, right? Like the regional races, the local stuff, it gets left to fester. And, and that never ends well. And that creates question marks and, and, I guess I say this as someone who's been successful. It's difficult to have someone question your success level when they're also saying it's because of something you're doing wrong. Yeah. You know, by question. Right. And I've always been open to tech. I've always told them that, you know, anyone who wants to come question me at my, my trailer is open and my cars are available. You bring a track official with you and you can look at anything you want. But at the same time, I think a lot of tracks and series can do a lot of own good for themselves by simply just doing some of this stuff themselves, right? And, you know, there's a lot of smart people at racetracks and series uh, who know a lot, like their stuff, you know, and that's from teching the car, like we talked about early on, of, you know, the seatbelts, this SFI stuff to flat out knowing what they're looking at, you know, and, and, and I mean that from an ignition standpoint, from knowing where wires should and shouldn't be coming in. There are some cars that are, a mess you'll never be able to figure out where wires are coming to and going yeah. from but you know when you've got wires coming out of of uh, wheel bearings um probably a question mark right now you have bigger things like race packs they need drive shaft sensors you know but when you only have a two magnet sensor uh, and i wish I, I i should have brought a race pack graph and brought it to this i, I thought about this maybe like 10 minutes before the show um I've been fighting an issue for years with my race pack graph, trying to figure out where my wheel speed issues are coming from on the Corvette until I had someone show me that it's because I have a two magnet collar. It's trying to pick yeah. up, you know, a movement that 
doesn't have enough sensors to get accurate. So then I thought about, okay, well, if there's variance in this graph by three or four hundredths, it doesn't make a very good cheating device when there's three or four hundredths variance on this graph, right? Off of the first half a second. So, you know, if you have an eight caller, okay, you've got accuracy, right? But like being able to at least see these things and understand like the race pack tying into an ignition system um, doesn't mean that it's a cheating device, right? Like mm -hmm. there's a fundamental aspect to a lot of this stuff, I think, but it's easy to tech. I mean, if you go to tech with any of the car other than, um, you know, a drag store, most of the stuff's under panels, but it's usually only one panel. It doesn't take much to look at this and be able to figure this stuff out, I think. And thus in tech, rule things out. You know, as I said, if anyone's willing to cheat at a bingo event for, for $200, you know, to run for $1,200 at, at a local track, to be able to just pull panels and verify things, right, shouldn't be a big deal. I think it rules out a lot of issues, you know, like no box racing. No one's usually, the conversations usually end up about, uh, you know, where's the box hidden? Yes. Yeah, all the time. All the time, right? Right. So get under the car and look for wires. Like there, there's, there's easy things to do. I think to rule things out that if I, the tracks did more of, I feel like it would curb pit side conversations that don't need to happen, but also add more legitimacy to, to legitimately good racers and legitimately good moments for uh, streaks, if you will. Right. You know, and I think this is yeah. an issue across the board. This isn't a Canadian issue. This isn't a big money issue. This is a generic bracket racing issue. Absolutely. But it, it seems to, you know, fester in certain classes more than others, right? Like I've never been in the lanes and talked to anyone in an NHRA, like 90 racing or IHRA that's talked about cheating to the same extent that we seem to in other classes. Right? Yeah. Cause it's interesting. Right. And then with the 90 stuff, you're using a lot more technology and these guys are looking at a lot more stuff yeah. than at a normal bracket race. Right. And then it's, it's funny the technology used there where when you go to a local spot, and then, you know, because you have a throttle stop, somebody yeah. thinks you're cheating just for the sake of using that, right? Or you've got to uh, dedicated to this. Misunderstanding right. on stuff, right? Like that's the education level. Like the second you have this, you must be doing something. Like I've I've always argued about the throttle stop side of things, right? And are like, well, if you have a stop, you, you have the ability to just make the car do the same thing every run. I'm like, I do, do I? I'm like, I wish someone had taught me that when I bought that's it right. and put it on. Otherwise... Well, you know, why have I dial raced for so many years? I just go 990 all the time. It'd be perfect. Yeah. Um, everyone who ever won an NHRA or an IHRA event should have been able to go 990, you know, 13 consecutive times. Exactly. But it's a misunderstanding of what that device does and, and how it works versus how it can be used for cheating. Like anything can be used for cheating. If you ask me, you get me a nitrous system. Um, I can do the same things that people question on a throttle stop about how to make it run perfect with nitrous, you know. Um, yeah. there was a time in my life, I almost convinced myself to Billy Glidden this and try yeah. to do it, you know, but then you ask all the, uh, you open up the Pandora's box of, of issues when you start to do that. Right. But like, yeah. I was convinced. I'm like, listen, there's no reason why a stop should be disallowed here unless it's an outright, no electronics class, which we're not talking about in this facet. Right. So the thing that bothered me about it was always lack of knowledge. Yes. Second, someone doesn't understand something, they fear it. And then it sparks that that's got to be used for something illegal. Mm -hmm. You don't have to understand everything in your class, but if the people running the class, the organizations running the classes have systems in place to make sure they do and are checking it. Okay. I'm good. You know, yeah, I, 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 I feel better. About this. It's an interesting conversation to also look at for stuff like this. Um, Obviously, we're racing for big money here, right? <laughs> Sorry. Um, like Super Tour, for example, right? We have fives and tens here. Um, you know, and then same thing when you're like the 660 race and everything like that. Um, that's big enough money, right? You go to the States and you're racing for 50, 100, 250, 500, a million at some events. Um, that's massive stuff. Like, so somebody's going to cheat. Why would they cheat at the five or 10 grand race when you can go cheat? And race for a hundred, right? But that also opens up. There's a lot more people there that are paying attention to this because it's you know racing for a hundred or more. Yeah. You know, yeah. so there's more, you know, for one, knowledgeable people that know what to look for. Where you go and race somewhere at home for five, ten, twenty, for example, 
maybe there's not as many people around that would be able to identify what's happening. Yeah. Or even as we said, if you look at it, you know, oh, what's that? I don't know. Oh, well, it's whatever. Oh, okay. That's well, it's, fine. it's easy to hide up front. Mm -hmm. Like you get the the seventy five thirty one MSD digital box, right? That's the yep. box that has the the uh, um, um, like basically the Arc module built into it, right? It, it has uh, uh, um, wheel speed capabilities and, and traction control capabilities, right? It's an illegal box. It looks very similar to other MSD boxes. Like it's not like the grid where there's components to it outside of it that you have to plug in. It's an all induced box. If you don't know what you're looking at, it's very easy. I, I'm, I feel like I'm drawing on a memory here that I'm not sure where it happened, but I know it was on Canadian track and I'm fairly sure a gentleman bought a car, had this box and I had no idea what it was. Right. And it was just like a stumble across conversation that like, I'm pretty sure that's the illegal box. We all had to go look it up because none of us knew we, we'd never intentionally gone to find one. It turns out. Yeah. Like he wasn't using it for anything. He bought a car, went to the track. It was all working, but I think it was a heads up style car that they'd kind of repurposed for bracket racing. So it was a bracket car, you know, that box came out of that car, not because he, he was worried about it. He just flat out knew like this was a bad place to be in if that's what that is. Right. Yeah. None of us knew until we went and looked it up, you know, and, and I think he'd run at a few events. I hadn't done much like it's, you know, just doing well, like don't get me wrong. Yeah. But what it ended up stirring on was, okay, how many other cars are out there with that same type of thing that just don't know. Right. And how many of them maybe do know, like, you create a question that doesn't need to be asked, I think, right? If, again, it's being policed properly, yeah. right? And, you know, knowledgeably, right? Yeah. Um, it, it's not something that just needs to be, well, what are the odds someone's doing something? Exactly. And then you would notice to a certain point, um, I would think, so I've talked to a few other people about this that I'm like, it should be obvious if you're cheating because you should be ridiculously better than everybody else. But on the same hand, you could be cheating and still not be very good, right? There's no. a lot of variables on a racetrack, right? Whether you have, and this has been not a huge issue, but the starting line, right? Everybody looks at that. And then, you know, whether you have a sensor that, you know, sees the first yellow light. And then now we've got uh, timing systems that try and combat that with, um, whatever it is, that really dark light they have in the center. I don't know if it's got a name, but then it'll kind of trigger trigger before. Yes. Your sensor should be able to find it. Yep. Um, so. And the funny part about that, that is, like I took, there's a training course I took, so we have an auto shop, right? Some people may not know that. We have a family automotive business, right? So we took a training course on start stop systems in cars. And I'm sitting there working myself because I'm, I'm not a technician. I'm one of the guys that's like own the shop. I'm a server. I mean, literally everything, but not a technician. We're yeah. talking about Mercedes Benz and their start stop systems. And they use optical sensors to pick up on lights on, on the, the, the stoplight to be able to see the change from red to green and then restart the motor to leave yep. so that it's not an auction of, of everything else. And I might've been talking about some people of what a start stop system is, but again, Google will tell you. And if you don't own one, it's a terrible system to have to deal with, but they get ready to change a bunch of starters, then you're good. Right. Exactly. Yeah. But this is something that's in Mercedes Benz that's sold to everyday people. And it wasn't until I had that moment where I perked up and I'm, I'm looking at this going, this isn't every, not every car. This isn't, this is an everyday vehicle. Now this isn't like science fiction type stuff. And there's a lot of lights out there inside. It's like, it knows how to pick this up. I don't know if it can do it consistently. I don't know what level of uh, variance it has. Right. I mean, we're winning and losing races by the thousandth of a second. If it has a variance of a 10th, this is irrelevant technology, but it was one of those moments where I'm like, huh. And I've heard people talk about optical sensors and I ever, I always dismissed it as like, that's plausible. I'm not saying there isn't one The technology world is filled with them, but you know, could you put it into a car and put it on a racetrack? And then all of a sudden I'm listening to them talk about a Mercedes Benz at a stoplight, being able to pull away and read the colors of a, of, of a tree yeah. right? Yeah. Um, and dismiss everything else and start a motor up. And I'm like, okay, that's, that's now in a car. You're getting there. As a race car. Yeah. And then so, that kind of like that, that circles around to a certain degree of the electric car that we talked about two weeks ago. Yeah. All the new technology that you don't even know yeah. what is possible, right? Because as you know, 
we're dealing with old technology and race cars right now and then so much advanced stuff that's coming so fast uh yep. who knows yep. what can really be going on and what capability do you have to mimic that take the idea because there are a lot of smart guys around um you know or use one of those cars right somebody shows up with a mercedes-benz for you know the street class all of a sudden you start tearing them down you know hey what's going on you know like yeah like it, it opens up question marks down the road like i i i don't know i mean interesting fact right average car right now there's a hundred million lines of code to be able to make an average street car run that's how much program is in a computer I don't know what level of expert you have to be to be able to start to do things like that with the technologies we're talking about, but there are people out there who get paid every day to do this, whether they're in the drag racing world and specifically are trying to figure out how it would cheat. I feel like that's a minuscule percentage chance, but it's kind of crazy when you start realizing how close it's getting to the level you're at, right? So it's not outlandish, Mm -hmm. but it's a little maybe far fetched to say it's it's you know rampant, but again, when you're talking about the higher end of our sport, it's plausible that that type of stuff's being refined to try to be worked. If it's not there, and not yeah. saying it is, but um, it, it does create questions, right? Yeah. That is difficult to keep up, right? It's yeah. difficult yeah. to keep up, but it it shouldn't be something where it's it's you know we can't, so we won't. It should be we're going to try our best and and. Um, and try to keep up with it and figure it out. And, you know, if we don't know how to police this, we should try to figure out how to police it. Yeah, you know, for um, sure. Before it does turn into something, right? Because you, you never know, right? And then what's the worst case scenario, right? You go, you check everybody's stuff, yeah. and everybody's all good, right? Yeah. Was that such a terrible thing to yeah. just verify that? Exactly. I got a great comment here. I got to bring it up for uh, auto. The track I run talks about the stuff tech inspection. Tech inspection. There we go. Can really fall off, so be easy to cheat. What can you do? So that's a good question for it, because that's what we also want to hit, right? Because and we've looked this up. Um, can't remember the part number for it. Um, the unit for the the MSD unit. The arc module. No, the unit the for testing it. Oh yeah, I forgot to put that in the, the note. So yeah, there's a handheld unit that MSD openly sells. So you can buy it anywhere. I did price it actually through uh, through the shop, uh, through our, our performance account. Um, NHRA and IHRA, IHRA used to use it, um, but NHRA use it and they can detect RPM limits. Uh, they, they, they use it a lot for heads up cars. It's predominantly a heads up car. The more I read about it, it's one of those things. They use it in stock car racing to determine that, you know, peak RPM settings, timing settings, like anything that can be a spec. But it also tells you every device that's hooked up to um, that, that grid. So if you've gone and hid the arc module, you know, so it's not there to be seen and you're hoping that you've covered the light up, like this unit tells you, it's a readily available piece. I, th- I felt like if I was running anything with a heads up type series, and I've never seen one on the track, maybe I've never looked for one. There's enough pro mod type series around that I thought I would have seen one maybe by now, maybe not, but it's not that hard to get. If I'm running a big money series, A, I'm figuring out, I know, I'm just running a series, I think at this point forward, I'm going out and educating myself on this. And depending on what I'm doing, maybe buying one of those just to randomly plug in just to keep that, you know, I don't know if this is a good quote or not, fear of God of getting caught type of mentality out there. Yeah. Right. Um, I'd rather have people have that discussion there that, that they don't want to get into trouble with this stuff or that they're, the, those guys are looking than to just have it be a wild west everywhere. Yeah. Right. So, um, we should look that. I, I have tried to look it up here real quick and I couldn't find it. But again, it's an MSD testing unit. And all it does, it's it's advertised as such, right? Do you need it if you know what you're looking for? Maybe not. Is it worth having if you get to a certain scale of racing? I would say I would buy it, right? Yeah. Just so that everyone saw I had it and we would plug it into things as we went along. Right? Yeah. Best- What's an optics thing for a, for a promoter, right? If you roll into somebody's race, hey, you know, we're doing this, we're doing that, we're doing whatever else to verify that everything is fair that everybody's on the same playing field yep. um you know that's a great it's encouraging for the racer i guess yep. that you roll in and a lot of people like you feel like you're equal to everybody i know some people like that's a tough thing right you roll down and you watch these guys racing and it's intimidating yep. to a certain degree 
Yeah. So then kind of to make sure, you know, clear the air on it a little bit. And this would be great. I know Michael Beard's watching because I can see him commenting through it. Uh, this would be a great episode to have Michael back on for uh, later on would be how they police it more at yeah. their events. Um, I was speaking to Travis um, this week as well, actually earlier today, about this, about his opinion on it, because you know he's got his races going on. Yep. Uh, and he is working with a, a tech knowledge guy um, with EFI stuff, and he knows, well, I'm not sure what he knows. He is going to be the tech guy. Um, and so I actually, I asked Travis about when I go out there um, in June to race, I would love to be a part of that process to really see how it goes and then see what you're looking for and what you find, yep. right? How do you prove this is okay? And then if it, if, if it happens to not be, how do you prove that? And how do you know that as well? One of the, and that's, you know what, that's a good place to be. When I went to the million in six, 2016, I, uh, I spent numerous days sucking badly. So I had a lot of time on my hands until I, 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 I know that I did great. We went some rounds in the end, but uh, one of the things my brother and I did was um, we stayed up because uh, we wanted to go see them do tech on the cars. I, I think the quarterfinal, so 16 or less, every time, every loser had to come back to the staging lanes, like straight back. And I think it was Cody Harger, uh, if I got that name right was doing tech for the, the folks uh, at the race. I don't know if he still does or not, but that was the second year where they'd really doubled down on making sure that they were checking everything. So they went back. So we went up and watched. And I figured one of two things is going to happen. They're either going to start to do tech and they're going to kick us all out because they don't want anyone around watching while they're doing tech, or they're going to let us all stand there and watch while they're doing tech, right? To keep it open, authentic. And uh, we were one of maybe six people there at like 1 a.m. watching this, but... We watched them jack the cars up. We watched them checking wheel bearings. We watched them checking under the cars. I watched Cody crawl on the ground from front to back, from door cars to dragsters, plugging into the MSD units that could be plugged into, checking for the ones he could. He had a laptop at the time to do it, I think. And it was interesting to watch because the process was different from um, styles of cars for the next, from what you could and couldn't do, right? So you had a mixture of door cars, roadsters, dragsters. It also was interesting to see what cars were going around, you know, when they were doing tech, I mean, pulling dragster panels off and seeing the same type of analog boxes that were sitting in my car back in the pits at the final eight of a 30 grand to win race, right? Um, watching Scotty Richardson in, in the, the Mr. Satellite Corvette with what, it was a nice car. It did not look that technologically advanced, you know, and he'd won um, one of the nights, I don't know if it was a 20K race, right? 2.30 in the morning, we're watching this, but it was interesting because at least I got to see tech and I got to see how they were going to do this. And they weren't looking for illegal SFI stickers. That would have been done Wednesday when they had tech tech, right? This was to make sure everyone who was in was above board, you know? And there was, I remember being in the lanes for these events and no one talks about this stuff there because they're doing stuff. They're checking it. They're, they're, you know, these aren't discussions that, you know, well, that guy won again, wonder what he's doing because the, pieces are in place to, to dismiss that, right? Michael touched on this even when we talked about foot break, when they were looking for certain devices and making sure that stuff's unhooked and this has continued to keep unhooked or, you know, that's not there. Um, and you don't hear about that at, at Loose Rocker events, right? You don't talk about, there's no conversations about, you know, guys running in and out, um, stealing money and leaving who may be doing things because he has systems in place, right? That's, you know, never been to a Loose Rocker race, but... That's something I already know about, right? And there's other big events that do the same type of things, large promotions, right? So it is an important part, I think, of keeping a clean record as a promoter. And it's an important part as a racer knowing that where I'm going to race is going to try to do this and look after it. Yeah. So I know, you know, when you see things happen that are amazing, people going on strings or doing incredible things, there's a very good chance, like there's almost 100% chance this is all legitimate. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know? Uh, back to your point, you know, you don't have to be perfect with a cheating device. You just have to be better than everybody else. Yeah. You know, or at least the guy beside you, right? Exactly. Just the guy, you know, that's it. You know, it, 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 you don't need to be, you know, double O and low dead on every time or like, you know, 10 total or better. Like, you, you just need have to be have good. 
better chance than the other guy beside you. If it makes you, uh, you know, if everyone's putting up 20 packs at a track and that's, you know, what it takes to win and everything's just splitting hairs, if you can be 10 or better every time, that's a very little difference because of what you're doing. That's all it has to be. That's a bad example because that's all pretty tight racing. But um, that's the difference. You know, it, I, I'll bring up the Nitrous Pro Stock again. The guys uh, who were cheating in that sort of stuff, the conversation was not, they weren't spraying 200 shots. They only had to be three or four one hundreds better than the other person. That doesn't take a lot of nitrous to do better than that. It's a, you only have to be minusculely better percentagely than the other person to have a better chance. That just means that you don't have to be perfect with this stuff. That's how it, I think, creates that world of mistrust. You just got to be better than, you know, the other person chance wise, right? And I just saw Troy's comment come across, right? And Great one. There Great you go. One. <laughs> I don't know if you know, Andrew, but Troy won Esta doing that. So, oh, is that where the comment comes from? Perfect. That is yes. <laughs> um, so we can switch gears like a little bit. We'll stay stay on the topic. We got to you know before we run out of time. We got a great comment on Facebook. I have the actual. A clear comment right here so i get it right for him uh so ian hill added um i'd love to hear about your use on the bump up or bump down uh how many times you've used it and how it's actually worked and yellow tinted visors so this goes along with the tech stuff we didn't really get um to the point of talking about you know tech is in like delay boxes and stuff like that but you know still goes along with it um so i don't know if you've used much of a bump up or bump down andrew I've, I've twice, twice used it, twice had wind lights and twice shouldn't have even bothered touching the button. But mm -hmm. I tell you, every time I hit the starting line, my finger is on the button simply because that is now part of the routine. And, and, and the two times I've done it were simply just, it was, it made me, I guess I'll backtrack. I have it. I set it up. I thought it, I, I see the upsides to it. Um, I've done it in two different ways. I've bumped on the tree and I've bumped on the throttle stop. The throttle stop one was sheer stupidity. I was at IHR at Grand Bend, uh, national event format. I had, um, I think it was Paul Racer Brown beside me or Pat Martin. Either way, they had a single digit on the car. So you immediately see single digit and go, great, like, this is going to be a hard matchup, particularly in round, I think it was one or two. It might have been a blind round. I had the car set up the way I wanted it to. Uh, mile an hour wasn't big. I leave the starting line. The second I leave, I feel the car quiver, and I immediately think, I've just lost a hundredth and a half. And I have no idea why I thought that. It just was my natural instinct. I immediately hit the bump down button, which was to pull one and a half numbers out. So if I'm set up to go 90, one hit of the button is sending me 88.5. Okay? Immediately hit the button. Feel good about what I've done because I'm setting up to try to be like 90. That was my goal on that round. Yeah. I'm rolling down to the top end. I'm looking over. Not a big mile an hour difference. It's tight. Wicked tight. I'm set up to take the stripe. I take the stripe. Wind light comes on. Everything goes to plan. Perfect. Right? Roll around. Grab the wind light or grab the ticket. Look at the ticket. I win 86.8 to 86.7. All I did was bump myself yeah, but... further down. There was nothing in that 64. Yeah. It indicated there was any problems. Yeah. Immediately, I'm, what are you doing? What just happened here, right? Like I took a, an 80, high 88 run, low 89, which for 90 racing on setup to try to go 90, I feel is a good pass here and just gave myself a worse chance to win. And the only time I did it, I was letting go of the button on the top bulb. I hit, I had to set up to bump down, right? Not bump green, but to bump a bad green, at least a better green. Yeah. I tapped it twice to be like, and that is, I think this is like a normal story to go like one, right. Mm -hmm. And I'm bumping like four thousand, some weird number. So I, all I took was a low teen light, which is where I want to be to go double a one, which is, you know, stupid flat yeah. out. Apparently did not miss the tree. I'm only hitting this button. If I think I'm like high twenties, thirties on a clear miss. So do I use it? It's there. Have I used it? Yes. Has it worked for me? Yes. Should it have? Twice, probably not. I just got stupid lucky. Yeah. Yellow visor, I've messed around with it. I have I think that's a very personal thing. I think everyone's different on it. I know guys who rely on it religiously. Um, others, like myself, I just, it doesn't work for me. Um, 
So wait, do you have bump up, bump down? Like, do you have a box that will bump up and bump down in your car? Where do you got? I do have a box that will do both. I only have the bump down uh, set up in it. Um, I've used it a few times. Not very good. Brody's got another great comment. There you go. Bump it on red. <laughs> yes. And uh, that was for 10, just so we know. I did. I do have that check. Um, I have the bump down. I've used it a couple of times when I was like, when I was supposed to use it, you know, when you're 30. Um, it didn't really change the outcome of the race. Uh, one time where it did change the outcome, not in my favor. Uh, final round, five grand. It was actually with uh, Fred Angers. You know, he comes up, he missed it a touch. He's 40. Uh, I would have been seven. I am now one red. Similar, similar as what Troy said. Uh, so to lose that one. Um, so I, I haven't had good luck with it. Uh, Terry Mira, he posted on there, used it all the time. Um, very similar, you know, my sister-in-law, Ashley, bangs that thing. Like, that thing is wore out. Um, stresses me out whenever she does. Comes back, <laughs> oh, yeah, I hit it however many times. I'm like, and she's the same thing. Like, she'll come up, like, you know, good, right? She'll be double O, whatever, um, and does it very well. I'm like, how are you doing it, right? How are you I just get so nervous about smacking it because I'm trying to kill the tree every single time. Um, yeah. But, you know, so it's he, Kenny Heber, the Canadian skinny Kenny. Um, I talked to him one time about this bump down and I hope I'm not giving away a secret here that was between us. I don't feel like he'd given me the asterisks of, you know, this is between us girls, Yeah. but he had told me he bumps on every hit all the time by design. Yeah. And, and the reason being, and I was, in, I was enthralled with this when I, until I tried it on a practice tree and, and realized I, it just ain't for me. Yeah. He sets up to be 30 and he bumps down only because in the process of bumping, he has to bump every time he lets go. But if he needs to bump more, he's already moving on the button. So Fair it's enough. a matter of instead of bumping, um, I don't know, twice or three, it's two more. So... I was kind of enthralled by that idea. I thought that's, that's kind of genius. Like if you're in the motion of, cause that's what the hardest part was. I was found recognizing I'm late. And then if you're, if you're the slow car, I mean, you've got no time. You have to recognize this immediately. Right. Correct. Yeah. When you start to bump, you, you've got to try to recognize fast, how much, how quick can you do it? And, and do I need to do it right up to the point of going green? Right. If you're the slow car or the fast car, you've got more time depending on what the interval is, but you still have to recognize all that. And the brain only moves so fast. The recognition of what the situation is only moves so fast. And oftentimes I felt myself hitting that button as I've left and the wheels are in the air. Perfect. So yeah. yeah, you know, like this is great. Now maybe that, you know, three or four numbers I'm holding will be useful to me now because I'm probably 40 looking perfect at least, yeah. but nonetheless, I've already left damage is done in his method. It, uh, in theory, you can hit it fast because you're already going to do it. Yep. But on the practice tree, I could not make that work. Yeah. So I find that you know. um, an issue I have with why I don't hit it, and this isn't a good practice to have. Um, if I come up late, I know I miss it. I immediately, like, I just feel shame, right? I'm just like, oh, man, that was not good. And I don't do anything about it. I just immediately feel shame. <laughs> you just, and, uh, I'm going to live with this result. As yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah. Um, as for the yellow visor, I used it for two runs. I felt I could not see, I could not differentiate the yellow lights from the yellow visor. So I hate it. Uh, Rachel uses hers all the time. She loves it. That seems to be whatever she's into. I can't, I cannot personally use it. I just said it is a personal thing. You just got to try it. Yep. Um, so before we carry on too far, we'll get ready for like, you know, we'll start slowing down a little bit. Uh, talk a little bit about next week um or two weeks you know, two weeks two weeks so I, can away. Um, I know dale, dale's got the amber shield he wanted to add that one i think that's the <laughs> first comment on our stuff maybe not um but uh two weeks we're gonna start talking about some points racing yep. point series do's and don'ts um i saw i i sent it to a lot of people um a racetrack in north carolina what is it? Coastal Plains. Yep. I think it's called. Um, 
they're giving out free steak dinners at Texas Roadhouse for just winning events, right? So I'm like, how can you make that's appealing? You just go to that race, right? Add that into a point series, you know, you've really got my attention. Yeah. Um, so particularly on those late nights where steak dinners aren't readily available in the pit area after a late win, yeah. right? <laughs> Absolutely. So that that's excellent, right? I love it. I love the idea. Uh, I'm excited for that conversation. I know we're both, you've done a, a lot of points racing as have I, uh, with different stuff. And then, um, obviously you for longer cause you've raced super pro for longer. Yeah. I've right? actually, I didn't realize this to the, today when we were talking about this a little bit, I've been in a uh, full size car for 20 years now. And that seems weird to say at the age of 37. Yeah. But, yeah, not. um, yeah, we've done a lot of points racing. I, I haven't points raced a lot recently probably around 2015. I think the last time I was really in a points program chasing it, I I used to live and die for points racing. I thought it was the greatest thing ever. And I, I grew up in an era where you had guys riding off the last 20 points champions, right? Like it was the pinnacle of regional racing because there wasn't big money racing at a local level. That was the biggest way to determine, you know, who was the best, right? Um, I feel like it's, you know, personally, it's waned off a bit because there hasn't been as good of incentive, to, you know, to, to win. It's it's become marginalized a bit. And and yeah. I don't say that in a derogatory manner of saying, like, you know, people just don't care. The tracks or series don't care. But the emphasis, I don't feel, has been on it as much as it should be. You know, you win a points champion. Those are some of the biggest memories I've had. Um, so it's a subject that I, I'm deeply tied to as much as it's not been a recent thing for me and my racing program. Um, but I mean, I've, I got a lot of great memories from it. I got a lot of great memories doing it. I've got a lot of great memories of not sleeping at night on a Wednesday, thinking about the next points race. And, uh, you know, I look forward to that conversation. It'd be a lot of fun to go into that, um, get people's comments on that, get their thoughts on it, get their memories on it. Cause, um, it's something that's big still, you know? Yeah, I agree. I love it. I love points racing um, when it means something. Like for me, like the Super Tour is that. Um, it means a whole lot to it. Uh, for myself, I, you know, I've said this to a bunch of people before, um, you know, winning Shannonville's Super Pro Series the last year that we did it like as a family and as a group of, of Shannonville racers two years ago, winning that meant the world to me because I grew up there, yeah. right? to do that. So that was the really a heavy points chase that I wanted to be a part of, you know, and then you go to other stuff and you're there, but you're not as all, all in. Um, so yeah, I'm excited for it. I'm, I'm excited to go over it. I know we both have a lot of ideas for it, yeah. you know, ways to kind of improve it or make it more appealing. Um, and things the point series do that, you know, they probably shouldn't anymore. Yeah. 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 <laughs> the good, bad and the ugly. Right. So yeah. Yeah. <laughs> points racing. So, so I look Absolutely. Forward to that. That's gonna be fun, I think. Absolutely. Um, so that's about that. Uh, I bring it up because I meant to say it when you did say it. So here, Dale's got it 30 years in the same car. He must be old. He kind of is old. Um, you win 20 years in Super Pro. This is my 10th year racing Super Pro coming up, which is wild. Um, and I've raced for the 10 years now. Yeah. So I've raced for 20 years because I started racing junior when I was six. So that's wild. Okay. Yeah, that you is. Uh, with that, I'm, yeah, that's twenty nine years then. I think yeah. I was I was lucky to start at eight. So yeah, it's wild. I mean, I I I know that's a weird discussion. There's a whole tangent there to, that that you can yeah. go on forever. But that junior program, there's a there's a discussion to be had. I think at a future episode about yeah. just and we have it right. We have that wrote down on the topics list, right? Yeah, absolutely. It's, cool. it's, it's weird to see guys talk at, at, at less than forty and be like, I've been doing this for 10, 20, almost thirty years, and it's legitimate. But nonetheless, so yes. for another episode. Yes, sir. Well, <clears throat> that's it uh, for the night. Oh, we got a good one here. Rusty, Russ says most points are series aren't worth chasing. Well, Russ, because that's because you didn't win it. So. <laughs> Shots fired. Fired. that's right how to let that go i'm sorry rusty um so that's it for tonight we're all good uh glad that you guys were here thank you guys thank you for participating in the comments everybody i know we didn't get them all posted up um 
but you know, thanks for being so involved. This is a lot of fun. I'm enjoying it. I know Andrew, you're enjoying it as well. Really? Um, make sure, sure you um, subscribe to the Bracket Life Brand YouTube channel. Uh, like, follow the Facebook page. Follow us on Instagram. Get all the notifications for when we're going live, what's going on, uh, all the news that we're going to have. Uh, go onto our website, bracketlifebrand.com. Sign up for the Bracket Life Bulletin weekly newsletter we send out. It's got all the information for our blogs, all the vlogs, sales, different apparel stuff that's going on. So keep up with that stuff. Other than that, we'll see you guys in two weeks uh, to talk about points racing. And, yeah, thank you guys very much. Thank you, Andrew. No problem. Have a good night, everybody. Absolutely, and we'll be talking to you. Have a good one. Bracket racing isn't just what we do. It's who we are. It's how we identify ourselves. What does bracket racing mean to me? It's my life. It's where my people are. My idols, my family, my friends. Bracket racing is life. Bracket life.